Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm your host today. And this is a show about condo living and uh, for people who live and work uh, in condominiums. And uh, you know, this is a significant portion of the community in Hawaii. I mean, we've got, I've been told that we've got about a third of the, the people who, at least who live in Oahu, who live in condominiums. And so uh, hopefully we have, you know, a lot of viewers out there who are watching the program. And today our program is a call to action. And this is about Senate Bill 551, uh, about non-judicial foreclosure that was recently passed by the legislature and sent to the governor uh, for, uh, for review and approval. And if he passes the signs of bill, it becomes law. If he doesn't pass it, if, it ve if he vetoes it, then it doesn't become law. And I have as my guest, one of the people who helped get the law passed this year, Laurie McGuire, who is a partner with the law firm of Porter, McGuire, Kiakona, and Chow. Thank you for joining me, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Pleasure to be here. And your firm does a lot of condominium and community association law. Yes, I'd and say probably about 80% of our practice. And can you tell our viewers what kinds of things you do for associations? Oh, my. Well, associations are like many municipalities. Mm -hmm. So we do everything. Um, we collect their maintenance fees, we um, enforce their covenants, we draft their governing documents, we amend their governing documents, restate their governing documents. Um, if they have any issue um, with construction defects, you know, if there's a problem with their building, uh, we address that. Um, if they need repairs, we help them obtain contracts uh, in order to obtain the repairs, you name it. We do it if it okay. relates to condos. And this mm -hmm. Senate Bill 551, I mean, that, that, that hits all the, the, the areas that you mm -hmm. basically practice in, right? Well, it does in the sense that it relates to our ability to collect maintenance fees. Let's yeah. talk about maintenance fees. You know, a lot of people out there, they don't really understand condominium finances. So can you give us mm -hmm. a, a really short uh, uh, class on how does a condominium operate? How does it operate? Well, you know, a con condominiums are creatures of statute. So every, every issue that deals with a condominium, there is a statute that governs that particular issue. And so condominiums operate on a zero-based budget, meaning the funds that they obtain to operate are obtained from the maintenance fees and the reserve fees that they collect from their owners. And this is a monthly fee that the, the yes. unit owner pays exactly. to the property management company. Exactly. And so these fees are what the association uses to operate. This is what pays their bills. So they can pay the electric bill, the water bill, um, pay to maintain the grounds. I mean, you name it, these fees are what pays for that. And so what happens if you have... 10 people in, in a 100 unit association who don't pay their fees. That's a real problem. I mean, that's 10% of all your owners. Think about you running your household. If all of a sudden your income was reduced by 10%, that would be quite a hit for you in terms of your ability to pay your bills, to operate your own personal budget. The same thing applies to condominiums. If certain owners don't pay their bills, if 10% of the owners don't pay their bills, then that is a real hardship on the other owners because they are the ones that have to make up the difference. And how do they make up the difference? They end up having to special assess or get a loan in order to acquire the difference. And so um, that, that, that results in increased maintenance fees for the next year. Yes. And that's, that's when, right. That's why mm -hmm. come uh, uh, annual meeting time, you have a, sometimes you have a lot of angry sure. unit owners who show up at the meeting and they want to know why did my maintenance fees go up this year that's right and and mm -hmm. and in times when you know we have a, a bad economy and people you know are out of work or maybe they're laid off mm -hmm. uh you know they can't pay their bills that's what happens that's right and so the alternative is to collect from those owners who have not paid their bills and senate bill 551 is critical to associations' ability to do that. Okay, and what does, what does mm -hmm. 551 deal with? All right, well, 
Last summer, in July of 2018, the Intermediate Court of Appeals passed, uh, excuse me, they didn't pass, they issued an opinion, which in essence stated that the legislature did not intend for associations, condominiums, to do non-judicial foreclosures unless they had a power of sale provision which allowed them to do non-judicials in their governing documents or unless they had an agreement with that particular owner uh, allowing them to foreclose on that particular owner. And we know that, that, that no such language exists in the governing documents, and we know that there are no agreements. What is the basis of well, the associations doing non-judicial foreclosure? This has been going on for 20 years. And what I mean by that is back in 1998 and 1999, the legislature recognized that there was a real problem with associations and their delinquencies. And it was a hardship on the remaining owners, the timely paying owners, because they were having to increase assessments in order to pay uh, for those owners who weren't paying their bills. Mm -hmm. And so the legislature passed uh, in 1999 Act 236 which allowed associations, condominiums, to do non-judicial foreclosures. Well, in the so, so the language is in the statute. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was initially passed in 514A-90, and then in 514A-9, I'm, I'm sorry, 514A-82, subsection B, subsection 13, passed a provision that said all bylaws, all condominium bylaws were deemed to include a power of sale provision, which allowed them to do non-judicials, mm -hmm. non-judicial foreclosures. So even though, even though uh, you had, um, uh, you know, there was no uh, written agreement between a unit owner and the association, the language of the statute yes. said that the bylaws of every association that was then in existence Correct. would, con would, you know, would contain a provision. That, 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 that there was an agreement between every unit owner and the association. Yes, yes. Okay. So associations could do non-judicial foreclosures. Okay. And in the Sakal case, the Intermediate Court of Appeals ignored the last 20 years of legislative history and said they found no legislative history. Mm -hmm. So we had to go to the legislature this year, and the legislature corrected the record to show, in fact, that there was a complete history uh, dating back to 1998, 1999, 2004, 2012. I mean, there was an incremental history that showed as far back as 1998, associations were allowed to do non-judicial foreclosures. And then as time went on, they added more um, consumer protections to that mm -hmm. because you had the, uh, the owners on whom the association was foreclosing, basically saying, this is a hardship, we need more protections. And more protections were added to address their concerns. And in this last legislative session, we addressed even more protections, uh, input even more protections in Senate Bill 551 well, to you know, we'll, address we'll those concerns. We'll get to those additional protections, but you know, the Sakal decision, what happens? What, what is the impact of that decision? I mean, what is so important that... Uh, you and others had to go to the legislature to get Senate Bill 551 uh, enacted. We had several attorneys in town that were filing multiple lawsuits. Um, one attorney uh, had filed a class action lawsuit seeking to sue multiple condominium associations, over 50 mm -hmm. uh, condominium associations, um, for doing non-judicial foreclosures. And, uh, and that was entirely wrong in light of the legislative history. And for, for, the, for these, um, and the non-judicial foreclosures that had occurred, uh, I mean, that was based on the fact that people weren't paying their maintenance fees. Right, exactly. Right? And it was based on the legislative history and the laws that were enacted in order to do those non-judicials. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. so it, the, the whole upshot of 551 is basically to stop these new lawsuits that are now saying, okay, now, now, be based on Sakal, we don't really care about the merits of the non-judicial foreclosure and the fact that you know uh, this was made, uh, this was done, so the, the that you were allowed to do the non-judicial foreclosures in order to recover your maintenance fees. We just going to sue you because I mean you weren't allowed to do it. 
according to the Sokol court. That's right. That's right. I mean, we haven't had, you know, there were some other lawsuits that had filed prior to Sokol, but Sokol really opened the floodgate. And so, mm -hmm. so what this does mm -hmm. is it, it threatens the associations who are just mm -hmm. complying with the law. Correct, correct. With, well, with, a hot, with new lawsuits. Yes. New lawsuits mm -hmm. by people who, uh, in the, the first instance, uh, lost their homes or mm -hmm. went through foreclosure because they weren't paying their maintenance fees. That's, that's correct. And now, as a result of the Sakal decision as well, uh, insurance companies have, um, in essence, as I understand it, refused to uh, insure for non-judicials. In other words, associations were going to be hanging out in the wind, uh, and they weren't going to have coverage for non-judicial foreclosures. And so, so this means mm -hmm. that it would have been more expense oh, for yes. the associations. Definitely. Just because that they were complying with a law that was okay at the time they were doing the non-judicial foreclosures. Correct. And so they're basically mm -hmm. being punished uh, in retrospect right. for something that was legal. Correct. That's and, correct. And, and mm -hmm. that's the, the part that's really hard to take. Yes. Yes. Right. And and so 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 what happened this session with 551? Uh, well, we went to the legislature. We explained the situation. They went back and looked at the legislative history and they agreed with us. And so what they did was they um, they passed the session laws that showed the, the lengthy legislative history in the preamble. And then what they did is they um, they amended the prior law to add additional consumer protections uh, to allow, basically to address the concerns uh, of those folks who were losing their homes to non-judicial foreclosures. You know, I mean, for example, one of the, the issues that arose was um, people were, had a misunderstanding as to what the non-judicial related to. In other words, um, some of the, the, the folks believe that um, the association by foreclosing would also stop the mortgage. In other words, they would no longer have to pay their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And that's incorrect. And so one of the, the, uh, one of the um, provisions that's now included in the bill is a notice to all homeowners that lets them know that this notice, this non-judicial relates only to the association's lien. The foreclosure on the association's lien, it does not relate to any of your other creditors, including your mortgage lender. So you need to check with your other creditors to see what effect, if any, this association foreclosure has on your other loans. Okay, well, you know, what we're going to do now is, is take a one-minute break, and we're going to come back, okay. and we'll be talking about some other provisions uh, in, in the new law. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Aloha. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Abicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Okay, well, welcome back to this uh, to the second portion of Con on Cider, and today's uh, episode is call to action uh, on what to do about Senate Bill five five one, and I have as my guest Larry McGuire, uh, who is a partner with Porter McGuire Kiakona and Chow, and we are talking about Senate Bill five five one, and Larry was talking about what 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 is in the bill, what what is this Senate Bill five five one 
do. You were talking about it has a provision in there. It has some consumer protection provisions that were That's added. Correct. And one of the, the consumer protection provisions was this notice that tells the, the, uh, the delinquent homeowner that, um, that the uh, debt is only for the association maintenance fees and it doesn't affect the mortgage or any other loan that might be encumbering the property. What else does Senate Bill 551 do? All right, yes. Well, one of the things that we had heard about while we were in the legislature was um, how it was affecting military, mm -hmm. military personnel. And so we've added a provision that in essence states that if you are active duty military and you are at that time deployed outside the state of Hawaii, then the association may not do a non-judicial foreclosure. If they do foreclose while you are on deployment, they must go to court to do that. And so that is a, a great asset for those folks that are in the military. And we have quite a few of them here. Yes, you know, because uh, we have all these people who are stationed at, at the various military bases. Right. And mm -hmm. the, the reason why, mm -hmm. too, it goes to uh, judicial foreclosure, there is something called the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act. That's right. Right? That's right. And mm -hmm. that act basically says mm -hmm. that if there is a military person who is deployed and they are being sued for foreclosure for non-payment of sums, that they are entitled to appointment of an attorney. Correct. Right? Correct. And so exactly. the Soldiers mm -hmm. and Sailors Relief Act mm -hmm. requires... The appointment of counsel. Right. So, exactly. so that means mm -hmm. that even if they don't want to get counsel, they get counsel. Correct. And usually mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the plaintiff, mm -hmm. the, the, the creditor, who ends up paying for this attorney. Right. Well, it varies. You're right. It varies. Yes. But it's, it's Initially, some, though, definitely. But it's That's to make true. sure that the military mm -hmm. person is represented in the foreclosure. Right. Exactly. And so that's mm -hmm. why it, they, uh, those types of foreclosures are not part of the non-judicial. And what, what yes. else is there mm -hmm. that, that it, now we have a mediation provision? Um, so basically, whenever you serve a notice of default and intent to foreclose on the owner, you have to notify them that they have um, the opportunity to mediate before this goes forward. So 30 days after service, they have within that 30 day period after service on them of the notice to mm -hmm. contact us, counsel, uh, to set up the mediation process in order to mediate any disputes that they may have as to the amounts due and owing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, the, uh, you must complete that mediation within 60 days of, um, of them notifying you that they would like to mediate. So that's an asset. Yeah. Uh, it slows the process down. It brings in a, a third party, the mediator, who can look at the big picture. And if there is a way to resolve it, then that's the point where it will happen. Okay. And that really opens the doors for settlement. So that's okay. a benefit as well. Okay. And this mm -hmm. new... Uh, this new bill, too, has a provision that clarifies, and, and in, in the previous le uh, legislation, it did clarify that you cannot do a foreclosure where the delinquency is based on late mm. charges and attorney's fees and legal fines, fees, the, penalties, uh, fines. Penalties. So right. this statute mm -hmm. makes it very clear that that can't mm -hmm. happen. That's right. That's right. right. If you're going to do that, if you're not foreclosing on maintenance fees and assessments, and you're only going after legal fees, late fees, fines, and penalties, you have to file in court a judicial foreclosure action. And, you know, one thing, too, going back to, you know, why this Senate bill is important. Why, why do the associations do the non-judicial foreclosure? What is the benefit to them for doing the non-judicial versus the judicial foreclosure? A judicial foreclosure is litigation. You're in court and litigation is very expensive. Uh, judicial foreclosures can take years to complete. Um, I'm aware of some right now, some lender judicial foreclosures where lenders are foreclosing on the mortgage that started back in 2008 and they're still ongoing. So the problem is um, you will start a judicial, but you're not sure when it's going to end because you're not the only party to the suit. So, for example, uh, oftentimes owners will obtain counsel. And, uh, you know, you have uh, when you when you file suit, you have to bring in all the other creditors. 
who have liens on title, and those creditors can file motions if they want to. So, I mean, uh, this litigation can go on for years at a time. And the problem with that is oftentimes during that period of time, that owner is not paying their maintenance fees and mm -hmm. their reserve assessments. Those are, so the delinquency is growing. You're still in litigation. You're paying, you meaning the condominium association, is paying the attorney to go through that court process. And in the meantime, nobody's bringing in any money uh, to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So it's very expensive and it takes a, a very long time. If you do a non-judicial, you can typically, from start to finish, um, end in probably, I would say, eight months to a year. Mm -hmm. And especially now with the mediation provision, it may take it between eight months to 15 months. Mm -hmm. But in any event, it is less expensive than the litigation. Um, and then Oftentimes at the auction, nobody will be there to bid on the auction because that particular owner may have a mortgage on title. And so the association is foreclosing subject to that mortgage, mm -hmm. which means at any time that lender can come in and foreclose. The lender is not required to step up at that time just because the association is foreclosing. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when you get to auction, nobody's there to bid. Mm -hmm. Only the association is bidding, so oftentimes the association is the one who purchases the unit at auction. And once they get that unit, then they rent out the unit. And the rents that they obtain can go to offset the delinquency. And so at least the association He's has money coming yeah, in cash flow. until such time as that owner's lender, the prior owner's lender, comes in and forecloses. Mm -hmm. And when that, loan, that lender comes in and forecloses, then you lose that unit. So the association is able to get the rents for a period of time and use those rents to offset what's owed, should they choose to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that means that at least they're getting some cash flow yes. uh, to help pay the bills for, yes, the, for, definitely. The, for the association. Because otherwise it's a real hardship on those owners, the paying owners. And as you know, here in Hawaii, we have lots of seniors mm -hmm. who are on a fixed income. And so they buy into a condominium and many of them have never lived in a condominium. So they had no idea what they were getting into in terms of the fact that now they have not just a mortgage payment, but they have a maintenance fee that is subject to rise every single year. Mm -hmm. But their, their income, many of them are on Social Security. That income is going to increase only uh, a, a small amount each year. Mm -hmm. But their maintenance fees may go up quite a bit, depending on how many delinquencies that association has. Right. And so that means that it's, it's really important for everybody I mean, the, theoretically, if everybody pays their maintenance fees, then there won't be this issue of every year the uh, maintenance, maintenance fees are going to go going. up in Correct. double digits. Correct. But mm -hmm. if you have delinquencies and in time when you have economic hardships when people are out of jobs and not working, I mean, then it just gets, it gets worse. Right, right. And that's what we had, if you recall, um, about eight years ago, eight, you know, mm -hmm. In 2008, 2009, 2010, had we not had the ability to conduct non-judicial foreclosures, many associations, I think, would have filed bankruptcy. They would have had to because they had just a huge percentage of their owners were delinquent. And in fact, mm -hmm. I think that during that period, uh, the, uh, the, I didn't realize how important it was to, for the owner occupancy ratio. Mm -hmm. I, I know that... Um, uh, I, I know it came up in, in a conversation about, well, how many owner occupants are in your building? And I figured, who cares? But, you know, when, in times, it, it, mm -hmm. it, when you have times of economic stress and you have investor owners, like a lot of people on Maui had in Kihei, right. Mm -hmm. right? You had a lot of mainland owners and they basically abandoned their units. Right. And so if you were 80% mm -hmm. investor owned and 80% of your owners decide they're going to walk because they can't afford to, you know, have the second home. Right. Then your cash flow stops. Oh, yeah. It was, I mean, it was a nightmare. It, it was mm -hmm. it was it was kind of crazy. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. ah, this is why mm -hmm. they ask. And so for those of you mm -hmm. out there, this is another reason for you when you're starting to buy condos or, you know, somebody you ask for the owner occupancy ratio mm -hmm. because you want a lot of owner occupants. 
because those right. people are, you know, they're, you know, they, they are more engaged in, in, in the operations of, of, of the building and, and they're more likely, you know, to not want the... They'll pay their bills. Yeah, they pay their bills, mm -hmm. right? And so Correct. the more owner occupants mm -hmm. you have, the, uh, the better finan mm -hmm. the chances are the better financial uh, condition you're going to be in. So why are we here talking about Senate Bill mm -hmm. 551 today? Because we want the governor to sign this bill. We want the governor to pass this bill. And so we are here to ask all of the owners, all of the viewers out there to contact the governor. And we have mm -hmm. uh, indicated mm -hmm. a website. And in fact, if you go to this website and there's, this go there's the governor's phone number uh, and there's mm -hmm. a website. If you go to that website and click on it, there's a box that says legislative response. So you click that box and you just say, please, Governor Ige, please pass Senate Bill 551. Yes. I mean, so mm -hmm. we have uh, enough people, you know, going onto the website. And by calling that number, don't think that the governor is going to answer the phone. Because I know a lot of people are, are scared to say, oh, I don't want to call the governor. What if he picks up the phone? What do I say? <laughs> You're going to be talking to a, a legislative assistant. Uh, not, you probably won't even get the governor's secretary. But anyway, you will be talking to a person who will be just taking messages. And so if you say, please tell the governor to sign Senate Bill 551, they will say thank you. And they will make a notation of uh, your message. And they will uh, n notify the governor that there are this many calls for these bills. And these are the yeas and these are the nays. And, uh, so, and, they, and the governor sometimes is influenced. And so our, our thinking is that the more calls we can uh, make to the governor uh, or emails to the governor telling him to pass Senate Bill 551, that will demonstrate to the governor that all of us who live in condos who are making the call to him, mm -hmm. you know, and who vote, who vote. Yes. It doesn't mm -hmm. hurt to say, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm a voter and I would like the governor mm -hmm. to sign Senate Bill 551. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's why, you know, we're here today talking to you mm -hmm. guys and asking you to help in getting this bill passed because it, it, it's going to benefit anybody who lives in a condominium. It's going to benefit everybody who lives in a condominium. Right. Definitely. At one point or another, and it, we will all it'll benefit help you from in it. your pocketbooks. Yes. And so this is the time. This is why this is a call mm -hmm. to action. And we thank you very much. I thank Larie for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And, and thank you for all your hard mm -hmm. work on getting this bill passed. I know you're one of many, but th yeah, thank I started you. I say thank it was you. a team effort. Yeah. You and, were one of them as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. and, and to our viewers, please call in to the governor or email him. Uh, remember, pass Senate Bill 551. That's the message we want to get to him. And thank you very much for mm -hmm. joining us for this episode. And please make sure to mm -hmm. tune in next week at 3 o'clock for another episode of Condo Insider. Thank you. And mahalo. Mm -hmm.